You're listening to the Eldest Jiry Channel. <laughs> The Last Patriot by Dave Stancliffe Performed by Otis Gyre Prologue Walter waited for a year for just the right moment to kill Captain Carl Gisborne. One long year of huddling in bad weather outside of buildings, restaurants, and skyscrapers. One year of following him in taxis and rental cars around the world. One year of trailing him when he walked in Central Park and down the sidewalks of New York, watching, looking for that perfect opportunity to murder his mentor. Today would be that day. Five years prior. Camp Perry, Virginia, also known as The Farm. After graduating second in his class at CIA University, Walter Moulter did his finishing school at the farm where he was taken under the wing of Captain Carl Gisborne. He saw something in the young man that he liked, unquestioning loyalty. Walter felt like he was a patriot and was honored to serve his country in the best way he could. The thing he liked the most about Walter was he did what he was told without question. Captain Gisborne personally shepherded him around the international spook community introducing him to contacts in foreign governments and underground groups. He accompanied him on his first assassination attempt. The target was a German politician suspected of plotting a coup against the current government with the Russian Mafia's help. The current Chancellor was aware of his adversaries and didn't want any of his men involved in an assassination attempt. Instead, he called on his CIA connection, Captain Gisborne, to eliminate his enemy. That task became Walter's assignment. Two days later, the German politician came staggering out of a local beer house with two friends after celebrating his birthday. It was dark, and there was no one on the street as the three men laughed at their efforts to walk. They never noticed Walter step out of a dark alley and come up behind him. The silencer on his custom 9 millimeter pistol made a slight puffing sound three times, each bullet striking its victim in the back of the head. Afterwards, Captain Gisborne joked about getting three for the price of one. We must have standards, he chuckled over a shot of scotch. In that way, Walter understood that collateral damage could happen, and it would be all right. One thing Captain Gisborne recognized early on with Walter was he truly believed he was one of the good guys, one of the chosen to protect democracy wherever his country and Captain Gisborne called on him to go. In order to keep him thinking that way, he constantly indoctrinated him, assuring him the country was safer because of his efforts and how lovers of freedom throughout the nation prayed for men like him. Walter lost count of how many men and women he killed after three years. He lost touch with his parents and siblings and lived alone in a hotel. He had no possessions other than necessary things like clothes and hygiene products. He didn't read magazines or books. He seldom watched TV unless there was a news event on that he was interested in. In Walter's profession, there was always the chance things could go wrong and he'd get killed. It was a given he lived with. The law of averages finally cut up to Walter, but not quite the way he would have guessed. He found a handwritten note that was slipped under his door when he woke up one morning. He recognized the script as Captain Gisborne's. It instructed him to meet him in Central Park that night at 11 o'clock. Walter's inner radar buzzed. This was the first time he ever contacted him with a note under his door. It was out of the norm, and his suspicious mind chewed on it like a dog with a tasty beef bone. Up until now, it was always a phone call that summoned him. He arrived at Central Park at 6 o'clock, giving him time to explore the area before the meeting at 11. He was dressed entirely in black with a black watch cap that could be pulled down and had eye holes to see out of. When he was within seeing distance of Cleopatra's needle, a red granite obelisk that stood 69 feet tall, he hid in some dense bushes without anyone noticing. There were just a few people lingering in the cool evening. 
A man and woman sat on a bench, staring in awe at the mighty obelisk that once stood in the Temple of Ra in Heliopolis in ancient Egypt around 1450 B.C. Lying down, he made himself as comfortable as possible, while keeping a sharp eye out for Captain Gisborne. The note troubled him. He tried to think why he chose that instead of calling. Calls can be traced, his suspicious mind suggested. It was after ten o'clock when Captain Gisborne showed up with another man. They stood in front of the obelisk and talked quietly. No one else was around. Beneath the old-fashioned street light at one corner, Walter could see their faces and read their lips, a skill he picked up years ago. Why now? The stranger asked Captain Gisborne. He's become a liability. How so? The Russians are on him. I'm told they have enough information on his assassinations to start a couple of investigations with the French and the Saudi government. They'll try to put him on public trial, and it will be very bad if our special unit comes under the scrutiny of the American people. Can't we hide him? He's a true patriot and doesn't deserve this. A true patriot, Gisborne mocked the man. You've got to be kidding me. There's no patriots nowadays, just specialists. That bullshit went out of fashion decades ago. You just need to do your job, Clancy. Walter saw enough and got up on all fours, pulling out his nine millimeter sans a silencer. He watched the man called Clancy go over to a tree and hide behind it. He circled around him and shot him in the head before he knew he was there. The shot brought Gisborne to his feet. Clancy was supposed to have used a silencer. When Walter stepped from behind a tree, Gisborne didn't hesitate. He popped off a short series of shots and hit Walter twice. He returned fire and stumbled into the nearby forest. He almost died that night. If it wasn't for a park patrol officer finding him, he would have bled out. He only stayed in the hospital for a day before leaving despite doctor's orders. He had one slug removed from his left shoulder and another passed through his chest without hitting a vital organ. A police officer was stationed outside his room, waiting for the doctor's okay to interview him. He knew it was just a matter of time before someone came looking for him. Despite the pain, he got up, unhooked his IV, and got dressed. The officer was talking with a nurse down the hall when he peeked out the door. They were still talking as he casually walked out and went into the opposite direction. He went unnoticed by the busy staff and made his way out the front door and into the growing darkness. As he was healing, he stayed in a small motel outside New Jersey City. It gave him plenty of time to think about getting his revenge and what being a patriot meant in the 21st century. He thought about all the things Captain Gisborne had told him over the years about what it meant to be a true patriot. He found himself, to his utter disgust, comparing his unquestioning loyalty to Gisborne to the Germans who fought for Hitler in World War II. He thought about the Nuremberg trials. He grew up believing in the American way. He was a Boy Scout, a quarterback for his high school football team. So much promise. Then he went into the CIA. But today was the day he would get his revenge. Gisborne disarmed his bodyguard, a former SEAL, and joined other mourners gathered at Arlington Cemetery to honor a former CIA chief from the Bush administration. After the ceremonies, Gisborne went to his car, but the driver wasn't there. Once a spook, always a spook. He realized at the last second that something was wrong, as Walter slid out from behind the black SUV and pointed a gun at him. For America! For honesty and decency! He shouted while pumping Gisborne full of lead. Before he died in a hail of bullets from the Washington, D.C. police, he cried out once more, For America! Newspaper headline the next day. CIA legend, true patriot, assassinated by a rogue agent. As it stands, the question of what patriotism really means can become muddied by history and reality. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen to this story in its entirety. If you enjoy what you hear and what I do and would like to support me and my efforts 
visit my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Otis Gyre. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button and subscribe today and share this video with everyone on your social media. It helps more than you could ever imagine. Again, thank you for listening and have a great day. God bless you.